Morning, church. Morning. Amen. Uh, can we encourage the worship team and thank them for serving us so well this morning? A round of applause. Thank you. Um, yeah, even as they were singing, I was reminded of just how precious the blood of Jesus is. And uh, even as we go over the message today and we'll be discussing Christ crucified, um, my prayer and my hope is that as we go over this message, may it, it ring afresh in our hearts and may we learn something new about Christ. May we relate to him in a new and fresh way this morning. Amen? Great. <clears throat> so today we'll be discussing Christ crucified. I hope you guys can hear me clearly. We're trying something new today. Um, today we'll be discussing Christ crucified. And last week, Joe spoke about just the amount of injustice that went into Christ as he was going through the trial. In fact, there were a lot of new things I learned last week about the Jewish leaders and just about how mafia-like they were. And it was these injustices that actually um, expedited uh, Christ um, in, um, going to the cross. But one of the key messages from last week was that God remained in control through it all because it was not by their wisdom or ingenuity or scheming that he ended up in the cross. It was because Christ chose to lay down his life. And Joe highlighted that clearly last week. And an indication further as we go into the crucifixion that God remains in control is the fact that in the period of the trial, crucifixion, and burial of Christ, about 30 prophecies were fulfilled. 30 prophecies that were spoken long before time were fulfilled at the cross and at the resurrection, meaning things that were prophesied before happened as God spoke them, and he remained in control over the whole process. Now, the fact that these things were prophesied does not make them any easier. Jesus Christ was about to die, or died rather, the worst kind of death on the cross. And for context, crucifixion was one of the most barbaric ways in which the Roman Empire decided, or rather the Roman Empire treated its criminals and killed them and executed them. And what made it so barbaric was the fact that it was by design meant to be torture and by design meant to be a lengthy process. Not only was the person suffering, but they were meant to suffer for a long time in that process. Oftentimes, when they hung on the cross, they would suffocate beyond just bleeding from the nail prints and bleeding from the nails that were pierced in their hands and feet they would suffocate because on the cross they would be weak and they wouldn't be able to draw their breath after a while. They needed to push, put pressure on their legs to be able to draw breath. And after a while when their legs gave out, they wouldn't be able to do so comfortably. And as they hung on the cross and their legs gave way, all the, their body weight would be now resting on their shoulders. And oftentimes, as the body weight rested on their shoulders, the shoulders would dislocate out of their sockets. And then they would begin the slow process of suffocation because their supporting limbs are both, or rather, all non-functional. And this was meant for the worst criminals, and it eventually was banned as time went by in the Roman Empire. Another thing is that there was no dignity in crucifixion. A lot of negative stigma was associated with crucifixion because people who were crucified were believed to be cursed. And when they hung on the cross, they were most likely take, stripped of all of their clothing, meaning that when they hung on the cross, they were completely naked. And it was done such that 
the location of, cruci of, of crucif crucifixions, the location was mainly in busy areas or in intersections or in areas where there was a lot of traffic of people so that all could see this, um, this punishment or the torture for the criminals. And today we will look at our king on the cross. We will look at Christ and we will observe the responses of different groups of people as they witnessed him being crucified. From, from these observations, my prayer is that we may assess how we respond to our king crucified. May we assess how we respond to our king on the cross. So I'll read from Matthew 27, verse 32 to 55. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he, had no, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and, my clothing, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If if he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and, he, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were, who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now on the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was a darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabakatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So we're going to look at the response of different people as they witness Christ on the mountain being crucified. And the first person, or rather the first group of people I'd like for us to observe is the passerby. In Matthew 17, I mean in Matthew 27, 39 to 40, it says, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Now for context, I want us to remember that the time that Jesus was crucified was a time of great many festivals, many Jewish festivals. And this would mean that a lot of people traveled from other places, other nations, other countries to come and celebrate those Jewish festivals in the nation. So even as that was taking place, I want us to remember that the town already was full of people who were not from there, full of people who, were from, who traveled from very far and came into, the, into, the, into Jerusalem to celebrate the festivals. Now for any of us who have traveled and we have traveled far, we know that when we travel, we tend to travel with intent and purpose. We already have an agenda preset, and when we get there, we tend to be busy because if we have traveled far, you want to accomplish a lot of things in the short space of time in the place that you have traveled to. I remember when I graduated from university, and it was four days after Nelson Mandela passed away. 
four days after Nelson Mandela passed away was when I went, we went for my graduation, and my graduation was in South Africa. And one of the things is we had a long list of stuff to do, and we were very busy by the time, or the time that we were in South Africa, me and my family. Now, one of the things that we could not miss was the fact that Nelson Mandela had passed away because everywhere you turn to, the topic of conversation was Nelson Mandela. Wherever you, whatever radio station, whatever TV channel you put, there was coverage over the life of Nelson Mandela. There was coverage of his funeral. There were interviews with his family. Whoever you talked to had an opinion of who Nelson Mandela was and who he meant or what it is he meant to them and what it is he meant to the nation of South Africa. And I remember during graduation, the person who was giving the speech, um, the, 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 the invited guest, as he was sharing about Nelson Mandela, he began to weep on stage. Now, as he was crying on stage, I, I could appreciate that he had a deeper connection with who Nelson Mandela was because he grew up in the nation and he experienced all that he experienced. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. He experienced all that he experienced going through the apartheid regime and the transformation that Nelson Mandela brought. Now, I did not have the same appreciation because I was not from there. Um, I didn't grow up in South Africa, so I didn't have such uh, an appreciation for what was going on. Um, so even as we were there, we would hear people talk about Nelson Mandela, but we carried on with our agenda as normal, and we remained busy throughout our trip to South Africa at that period. Now, the reason I'm telling this story is that similarly, the event that is taking place at the crucifixion is a lot of people from different places have come and they have their own plan and agenda. But even as they're in the city, they can't help but hear the news about this Christ who was on trial and now is being crucified. They came from other territories and probably didn't have a deep appreciation for what was going on. They didn't understand probably to the full extent that the locals understood who Jesus Christ was. But them entering the city, they would have heard rumors. They would have turned on their radio if they, there was no radio, but they would have whatever equivalent there was of media at the time, they all would have heard about this Christ who came, who is on trial, and is about to be crucified. And as they went about their agenda, as they were busy moving and, and going back and forth, it says that these passerbys, these were people who didn't stay, stay for the crucifixion, but they were moving back and forth doing their thing, from time to time, they would stop and look at Christ and make a comment. They would have seen people get into passion debate about Christ, but they themselves probably would not have the same appreciation. But as they passed, it says here, as the passers-by looked at Christ, what they did is they demanded him to prove himself. Their response is to command Jesus to respond to their skepticism. They do not probably have a full understanding or context of what's happening, but we see them say, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. They even speak about one of the things that was probably uh, an accusation against Christ. They say, you who said you'll destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. This would have probably been what was happening in the rumor mill, and they probably would have understood that one of the reasons he's on the cross is because he said, some of these statements. But what they command Jesus to do is to respond to their skepticism. Come down from the cross and prove the things that you are saying. Now, what we can learn from this is that in today's fast-paced society, regardless of religious beliefs or the lack of religious beliefs, whether you are a Christian, whether you are a Hindu, whether you are an atheist or an agnostic, you will inevitably encounter the story of Christ on the cross. As you go about being busy with life, as you go about your own agenda, everyone eventually collides with this story. And this story often faces skepticism and criticism as individuals want God to make a case for the cross. They demand logical explanations for the cross. 
They demand Christ to fulfill their conditions and meet their standards of rational thinking for them to actually understand about this Christ that they hear about on the streets. The primary focus is not on belief, but the primary focus is on making sense of the cross within their own mental framework. And as they pass by the story of Christ, they look at him and they say, Christ, come down from your cross and prove yourself. Come down from your cross and appease my questions. Come down from the cross and appease my rational thinking if you want me to believe in you. We've heard about you in the streets. We don't know much about you, but come down from that cross and prove yourself to me. And after they look at Christ and after they make these demands, they carry on with their way and go about their business. They do not stay to see the full end of the story, but they carry on with their agenda as normal. And even as society does that, I want us to note that as society, or rather these passerbys, made an appeal to Christ, Christ did not respond to them. He remained silent. The next group of people that react to the crucifixion are the Jewish leaders. In verse 42, it says, he saved, and this is the Jewish leaders now talking to the crowd, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. If he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Now, I'm tempted, I was tempted to call them the Jewish Mafia because of what we heard about last week. But I want us to examine the response of the Jewish leaders. First of all, I want us to note how the Jewish leaders were not addressing Christ. The Jewish leaders were addressing the crowd. The passerbys that came by looked at Christ and asked him to prove himself. But here, we see that the Jewish Mafia stand next to the cross and they say, he saved others, and himself he cannot save. The Jewish leaders begin to mock Jesus on the cross, and they begin to tell the crowd about who he is and why it is, they are, why it is he's on the cross and why it is they shouldn't believe in him. One thing for us to understand is that the, the Jewish leaders were actually the gatekeepers of truth back in the day. The Jewish leaders were the people who had the Torah, which was the word of God written down by Moses. They believed in God, and they believed that a Messiah would come and be crowned king of Israel. However, the king of the Jews that was hanging on the cross did not fit into their template. Jesus Christ did not satisfy the template that they had of the king that they were meant or rather anticipating as prophesied in scripture. Jesus was a threat to their way of life and a threat to the version of God that they worshipped. And so they address the crowd and they mock the idea of a Messiah crucified. They highlight that the only way they will believe he is king is if he frees himself from the cross. They believe that a king of Israel would come. They believe a Messiah would come, but they said this is not him. And if it is him, let him come down now from the cross and prove himself. Then we will believe in him. The Jewish leaders weren't like the passerbys. They had a vested interest. They were there and they were the ones who instigated the trial of Christ and they were there till he breathed his very last breath. The passerby came and went, but they were vested, they had a vested interest in this and their vested interest was to demand a sign in order to correct their beliefs. With the statements that they made to the crowd, they sought to influence the public by asserting that the crucifixion disqualifies Jesus from being king of Israel. Hence, they shouldn't believe in him. In today's age, many leaders who identify as Christians feel threatened by Christ's teachings because Christ's teachings often don't fit into the template of their life and their lifestyle. Christ's teachings often contradict and challenge the liberal beliefs and falsehoods which are prevalent in the church today. And so they make mockery of Christ. They make mockery of a Christ who plainly identifies sin as sin. 
if the Jesus of the Bible doesn't serve their appetite for gain, or if Jesus' call to holiness does not align with their lifestyle, they will then shout from the town center to all who would hear, and they will defend their version of God. They will then, sh uh, they, they will then convince the people to join them in their worship of another Christ. They will rally people and tell them and make a state and state a case for them to worship another Messiah and another king. Because this Jesus, the real Jesus, the one who's hanging on the cross before them, is not the Jesus that fits into their template. This Jesus is too blunt. This Jesus is too offensive. And this Jesus isn't good for PR. This Jesus will not bring gain to the people who would rather worship a version of Christ as opposed to the Christ who hangs on the cross. And so they promote their false doctrine and they seek to influence the masses with the same. They seek to convince the masses that he says he's the son of God, yet he cannot save himself. But we know that the motive that was driving it all along was that they believed in a Messiah, they believed in a king of Israel to come, but not this one who's hanging on the cross. And to this challenge for them, because they also challenge Christ to come down from the cross, Christ remains silent and he does not respond. I want us now to highlight another group of people that were there at the cross and their response to Christ. And these are the criminals. Because when I started reading today, it said that Christ was crucified between two criminals. Now in verse 44, it says that the criminals also began to revile and insult him. But we'll need to go to another gospel to actually understand what the dialogue was between the criminals and, I mean, between the thieves and Christ who was crucified with them. In Luke 23, verse 39 to 43, it reads as such. I will read first from verse 39, and it says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled, hurled insults at him. Unto you, the Messiah, save yourself and us. So here we see that one of the thieves commands Jesus to prove himself and save them for the, from the pain on the cross. The person who was talking was also going through the same suffering that Christ was going through. And in his mockery of Christ, he says, save yourself and save us as well. What I want us to understand is that the criminal was guilty and he was a recipient of a sentence which was just. He essentially was asking God to prove himself by delivering him from the consequences of his own sin. Not in repentance or as a result of a change of heart, but as a get out of jail free card. He was essentially telling Christ, make all this suffering go away. You have the power to, aren't you the Messiah? Then snap your fingers and save yourself and save me as well. If you are who you say you are Christ, then make all this pain and suffering go away. There's something that we can learn from this criminal's response. Because in this world, indeed, there is a lot of suffering and pain. And sometimes, like the criminal, suffering comes as a direct consequence of the sin in our own lives. If you commit a crime, you will end up in jail. And this person was consistent in the crimes he committed such that it warranted him dying on the cross. However, more often than not, the suffering that we experience in day-to-day -day life comes as a consequence of the fall. A consequence of when sin entered the world, when Adam fell. The source of most suffering is, is, is the first, or rather the source of most suffering is as a direct result of the sin that was committed in the garden and when sin came into the world, it broke it. The reason we live in a broken world today is because of sin. And regardless of whether you are criminal or not, you don't need to live long enough to discover that suffering and pain happen to everyone under the sun. And a key challenge in modern society today is its offense 
at God. Society is offended at God because if Christ, who died on the cross, is who he says he is, he can make all pain and suffering go away. If Christ is who he says he is, he can snap his fingers and we will all be free from pain. Why is there war? Why is there hatred? Why is there suffering? Why do people murder one another? Why is there sickness and disease in the world? If you are the Messiah, surely you can make all of this go away. That is the line of questioning that this criminal who was dying next to Christ asked. Aren't you the Messiah, then why is all this suffering happening? Aren't you the Messiah? Make this pain go away and draw us down from the cross. And if we're honest with ourselves, we as believers at times demand the same of our Lord. We ask a similar question to Christ. We ask him, aren't you the Messiah? Then why did so-and-so pass away who was close to me? Or aren't you the Messiah? Why am I going through this sickness and suffering? Surely you can snap your fingers. Surely you can make us come down from the suffering in this instance if you are who you say that you are. And similar to before, I want us to know that Christ didn't respond. Now, I want, I want to be careful here because we may mistake Christ's silence for indifference. We may take it as Christ telling the criminal with his silence that you deserve it. You deserve it, so just deal with it. Or we may think that even if he didn't deserve it, Christ was telling him to suck it up and to be strong. Jikaze. You know, make yourself, or rather, toughen up. And in society's cry to all the pain and the consequences of the fall, Christ does not respond with words. He responds with his life. Because despite the challenges from the skeptics, from the Jewish leaders and from the criminal, urging him to prove that he is king by coming down from the cross, he remained on the cross. He remained there. And what was keeping him there was not nails. It wasn't the nails that were keeping him on the cross, but his love for us all. Because while he hung there, he was paving a path to undo the ultimate consequence of sin. Not the consequence of the sin of the person who was a thief, or the consequence of the fall, which has brought in a broken world and pain and suffering to us all. But he was dealing with the root cause while he hung on the cross. Our king on the cross did not wait for acknowledgement or a throne. He did not wait for a clap offering or encouragement to respond to sin. Our king instead stepped off of his eternal throne, put on flesh, and died for all, even for the criminal. Jesus' whole life was a response to the cry of the criminal, the cry of society for deliverance from pain. Christ's life was a response and not his words. He did so with his actions, and his actions spoke even as he hung on the cross. As the criminal was saying, save us from this, Christ was doing that exact thing. He was saving all of humanity from the consequences of sin, not just the sin of the criminal that called, out, called him out. I want us to note the common theme in the responses that we have discussed thus far. And the common theme is that each and every person who responds to Christ on the cross ask him to prove himself. They ask him to prove himself as the Son of God. And to all of these responses, Christ remains silent. Not passive, but silent. Because he was taking care of the right thing, or rather the, 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 the root cause of all issues. If you remember back in the gospel when the devil tempted Christ in the desert, the devil tempted him in a similar way saying, if you are the son of God, then turn these stones to bread. Or if you are the son of God, then jump from this high building and the angels will catch you. We see that Satan, one of the things that he did or one of the themes of his temptation to Christ was to prove himself. 
And we see that these responses are potentially sponsored by the evil one himself because each of these responses say the same thing to Christ. Prove yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. If you're powerful enough to destroy the temple in three days, then surely you can come down from the cross. If you say that you're the son of God, speak. Let him hear you and let him bring you down. And the criminal himself says, aren't you the Messiah? Then take us down from here and the suffering that we go through. At this point, I would like for us to look at the response of the other criminal who was hanging there next to Christ. In, Luke chapter, in verse 40, it says, but the other criminal rebuked him, speaking to the first criminal. And he said, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. We see that Jesus finally responds. He didn't respond to the first three groups of people, but to this criminal, Jesus opens his mouth to say something. Jesus was going through torment of soul. He was going through physical distress, and he was going through the difficult, most difficult period of time in his life. He was about, or rather, he was bearing the sins of the whole world. But in that stress, he opened his mouth to respond to this person. I want, us to make, I want us to notice two things here, is that first and foremost, Christ was king. He had the authority to make this statement. He had the authority to tell this person that today you will be with me in paradise. That was an authority that could only reside with someone who was chief over the eternal realm that he was about to enter into. When they crucified Christ, they put a banner over his cross to say, King of the Jews. And they did it in such a sarcastic and ironic way to say that this is the guy who claims to be King of the Jews. But what is truly ironic is that they were actually accurate when they put that sign above him. Because not only is Christ king of the Jews, he's king of kings. He's king over all. And he's king who has the authority to say, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's what he responds. That is the response that he gives to this person who reacts to him on the cross. Jesus' authority extended far into eternity beyond the scope of our human perception. And I want us to note, secondly, that the criminal recognized his guilt. What was different in his response is that he recognized his guilt, and speaking to Christ, he says, Jesus, I cannot go where you're going unless you remember me. He said, Jesus, I cannot go where you're going unless you remember me. Unless you allow me and unless you save me. So Lord, save me. To such a cry, Jesus gives a response. He does not respond to the skepticism of society, and he does not respond to the false doctrine of religious leaders, but to a cry that's from the heart. He opens his mouth to say, you can come. Because that's essentially what Christ responded. He said, you can come. You can come to where I'm going. 
You can come to where I'm going because <coughs> I'm the one who has authority to admit you. But over and above that, I am here hanging on the cross so that you can come to where I will be. I want us to know that he didn't make the criminal suffering stop. He did not make him come down from the cross. The criminal still suffered on the cross. The criminal still had his legs broken and he still died a slow death. And I cannot guarantee to anyone here today that if you come to Christ, he'll make all the suffering go away. I have no scriptural basis to make that statement. But what I can say with confidence is that our king on the cross took care of the ultimate consequence of sin so that we all who ask can be where he is. He says you can come, and he makes that call to anyone who would have that same heart that this criminal had to say that, yes, I am guilty, and I deserve the consequence of my sin. As a result, Lord, remember me. Remember me in your kingdom. And what Christ says is, you can come. I admit you into the kingdom. Our king has the authority to do that. But over and above that, he's a king who, while hanging on the cross, was actually paying the price for the consequences of all our sin. You see, throughout history, society has grappled with the reality of Christ, a king crucified. And with varying voices and in varying ways, humanity responds to him. The story of the cross is both profound and significant, that it will ultimately demand a response for every living person. Every human being at one stage or another will need to respond to Christ hanging on the cross. And people respond differently. Some respond with skepticism, as we have seen, who want Christ to appeal to their rational thinking. And if it doesn't make sense, they dismiss him altogether. Others seek signs for confirmation. Like the Jewish people, if you are the king, then come down from the cross. If you are God, then do this, do that, and we give God an agenda or a list. And if not, then I don't believe in you, or I'll choose to believe in something else. In fact, some feel offended at God. When they hear of the cross, when they hear of Christ crucified, it's a message of offense to them because they cannot understand how a God can allow suffering in this day and age, or rather in the world. Yet others respond in surrender, like the, other, the, the second criminal on the cross. When they encounter Christ hanging on the cross and the reality thereof, what they respond, or rather the, the response from them is to raise their hands and to say, Christ, remember me in your kingdom. I know that I'm guilty. I know that I am sinful. I know that I deserve the death, or rather I deserve eternal separation from God because I've wronged him. But when you come into your kingdom, remember me. In spite of suffering, in, in spite of pain, Christ responds to say that I provide salvation. I provide ultimate salvation. I provide the deliverance from the ultimate consequences of sin, and he admits us into his kingdom. Paul captures all of these views well in his letter to the Corinthians. Because in 1 Corinthians verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 to 25, it says the following. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength.
I want us to note here that Paul in his letter touches the skeptic. Paul in his letter touches the religious person demanding a sign. And he says, to the skeptic, this thing may seem like nonsense. To the agnostic, to the atheist, to the person who thinks that the Christ, of God, Christ dying on the cross is foolishness or a fable, we see that Christ crucified is actually the very power of the message of the gospel. Christ, without Christ crucified, the message of the gospel is just another empty philosophy that people um, spend their time trying to, to build their lives on. And to those demanding a sign, they are offended at Christ. They say, this is not the king that we expected. We expected a king like David to come and save us, not someone born in Nazareth, not someone who's a carpenter's son, not someone who doesn't have um, the, the wealth and resources to mobilize a militia and deliver us from Rome. But Paul here highlights that again, it's the message of the cross that is the power of God. It's what will, confine the, it will, it's what will confine, confound all human wisdom. The cross is foolishness, and, and to the world it's foolishness because the wise of this world know better than to look to a dead man to set up a kingdom. When a man is dead, empires evaporate, and we see that all throughout history. So human wisdom and human intellect and rationale will say that if this person is dying now, then no way is his kingdom ever being going to be established in this earth. It's also foolishness because the religious Jews could never bow to a king from Nazareth who died on a cross. Nazareth was like the less privileged part of town, and nothing good came out of Nazareth, it says in the Bible. And so they offended at Christ who came from there and who died on the cross a most shameful death. And lastly, reigns end with the death of a king and they don't begin. Logic will say that when a king dies, that's when his reign ends. But in Christ, his reign actually as the son of man began when he died on the cross. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. He forever rules in his capacity as a son of man, and he was inaugurated after his death on the cross. In, in, in human logic, kingdoms end when a king dies, but we see that our king on the cross actually began his rule as the son of man for all eternity when he died on the cross for our sake. And so to all I would say, let us examine our hearts and see how we respond to this Christ on the cross, how we respond to our God hanging there. What is our response? If you are here today and you do not know him, I would say that you respond by recognizing your guilt and that the fact that God requires perfection and we have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. And hence, like the criminal, we raise our hands and say, God, remember me. Because we could never get there or we could never save ourselves. To the one under the spell of false doctrine, a convenient Christ, I would say repent. Turn from that thinking. Open the Bible and look at the Christ of the cross and heed his teachings. Because yes, at times he is too blunt. At times he may be offensive. At times Christ will call you to, to task and say that the way that you're living is wrong. But let us repent. And when we hear that voice, we adhere to it because it is our king who's telling us to live according to his state, according to his commands. And to the believer struggling with reconciling a season of pain and suffering, with the majesty of Christ, I would say take another look at Christ on the cross. Take another look and hear the message that he's preaching to you today. A message that 
He delivered his life for your sake and for all our sakes. He delivered his life so that we could be ultimately delivered from the consequences of sin. Yes, there will be pain and suffering, and I cannot stand here and promise you that pain and suffering will not exist in your life henceforth. But what I can say is that if you place your trust in Christ, if you place your trust in the King on the cross, he will indeed admit you into his kingdom because he died for our sake. Amen. Let us stand and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the hard reminder of what it is you accomplished on the cross. And I pray, Lord Jesus, even as we interact with people in society and they respond to you being crucified in different ways, I pray, Father God, that we may receive much deeper conviction for you, much deeper conviction for the gospel truth, and much deeper conviction to share this truth with all that would hear. For it is indeed good news, Lord, that you hung on the cross and you gave up your life for our sake. You gave up your life for the ultimate consequence of sin and you call us into your kingdom. You tell us all that we can come into your kingdom by your grace and by your mercy. I pray, Father God, for all the pain and suffering going on in the world, in this nation, and in the lives of all. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this may not be the enemy may not capitalize offense, Lord, to draw us away from you. But may we, Lord Jesus, draw closer to you and trust you, Lord, through the pain. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, I pray and I commit, Lord Jesus, everyone here under the sound of my voice who does not know you. I pray, Lord Jesus, you move in their hearts. I pray, Father, you grant them the grace that brings salvation. I pray you open and remove the veil from their eyes that they may come to a knowledge of your truth and surrender to you, O God. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please continue to ponder the message. Why did God have you hear this message? Why did he arrange for you to receive what you have received here today? You in particular. Why? There's nothing frivolous or capricious about it. What has he said to you? And for someone, perhaps the Lord has called you to an assignment. You know what that assignment is. But there are distractions. There are distractions that have that are calling out to you and that are seeking to ask you to do or to focus on what you are not called to focus on. But like Christ on that cross, perhaps it's time to focus on that assignment. It's time to remember what he called you to be and who you, he called you to be and what he called you to do keep going and work with the grace that he gives you to do that please speak to your father now personally yourself concerning your personal response to the things he has spoken to us through his servant That's why he hung on that cross. And 
say yes. Yes to all that you died for me for. Yes. Yes to what you are calling me to be. Yes. Yes. There are details to be worked out, but God, you can work out details. I want to say yes. much because your word is always very purposeful. Please continue to give us deep insight and understanding on what this means, on what you did for us on the cross and what it should mean in its fullness in each of our lives. Oh God, in our private spaces with you through various ways, please minister the truth of what Calvary means today and let that truth and let that light and life be made real to us and through us we thank you in Jesus name Amen so I would remind us of the notices please remember the singles meeting please remember that there's Mentoring, support, coaching, guidance available for single ladies, single gentlemen who want to prepare themselves to be the kind of husbands and to be the kind of wives that God wants them to be. And you can contact any of us um, to, to assist you, to plug you into it. And remember the beautiful ashes baskets are outside and you can see Trudy or myself concerning the outreach to, to the ladies. And remember your life group will be expecting to see you. All right. We will share the grace. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you. Have a really, really blessed day. Christ filled week.